All right. So let's uh, focus on reviewing, like I mentioned a minute ago, the chapters that we had before spring break and emphasizing a theme that I wanted to emphasize that I, I do talk about in the lectures, but haven't really emphasized to you guys here in class. Being in the lectures, it is in the reading as well. Let's go back to chapter six. And let's start with something I haven't talked about in class here called Cayley's theorem. So chapter six was about isomorphisms and automorphisms, automorphisms being isomorphisms, a special kind of isomorphism from a group to itself. Cayley's theorem says that every group is isomorphic to a group of permutations. Now remember, a group of permutations is just any collection of functions, one-to-one -one and onto functions from a set to itself that form a group under function composition. Our prototypical examples are the symmetric groups, S2, S3, S4, S5, et cetera, and the alternating groups, subgroups of those with that are even permutations, A2, A3, A4, A5, et cetera. But, those are not the only permutation groups. Any, any subgroup of one of those is also a permutation group. And you can have infinite permutation groups as well, where you are talking about a collection of such functions that are one to one and onto from a set to itself that form a group under function composition. Permutation groups can be infinite. They can have infinitely many elements. Anyway, just to remind you of that, the statement of this theorem, again, is every group is isomorphic to some group of permutations. It doesn't say what group of permutations, it just says a group of permutations. Though in the proof, you get to see what group of permutations is naturally isomorphic to the given group. And I want to emphasize that word naturally because the main theme I'm going to try to get across here in reviewing these chapters certain parts of these chapters, at least here in class today, is the concept of naturalness. Essentially, in a nutshell, it's, it's doing the only natural thing, the only thing that makes sense, and hoping it works, and quite often it does work. Okay, so I'll show you what I mean here. So let's look through the proof here. So G is an arbitrary group, could be finite, could be infinite. G could be an infinite group here. To show G is isomorphic to a group of permutations, well, you've got to come up with an, an example of a group of permutations that you think it might be isomorphic to. And when you first start thinking about that, that seems really, really mysterious. How in the world are you going to come up with such a group of permutations? Probably Cayley, the first person to think of this, had to do a bunch of experimentation, thinking about groups a lot before he realized that this was true. What is G bar going to be? You got to come up with some permutations that form a group using G itself. Using G itself. This formula right here, if you think of G as fixed, think of the G in this formula as fixed and think of X as a variable, is a formula that defines a function from capital G to itself, right? Because if you plug in an element for capital G in place of X and compute G times X, that will be another element of capital G. It's a function. In fact, it's a one-to-one -one and onto function from G to itself. It's a permutation of G. That takes proof. Does the book prove it's one-to-one -one and onto? We leave it as an exercise, exercise 35, to prove that TG is a permutation of the set of elements of G. Maybe we should think about that proof right now. I can see putting that on the test. So TG is a function from G to itself, certainly. So that part of the definition of a permutation is true. This is an element of capital G for all 
x in capital G. It's a function from G to itself. Remember, think of the little g here as fixed or given little g in capital G. This is true by closure, since capital G is a group. It's in G, this, the output of this function is in G by closure, since capital G is a group. Or as our book would say, this, this formula defines a, a binary operation. Well, he's using a binary operation, I should say. So that part of the definition of per permutation, the fact that we got a function from G to itself is satisfied. The other parts are, is it one-to-one -one and is it on-to? Is it one-to-one -one first? I'm not going to do formal proofs here, just try to think about the ideas here. Good review. What does it mean to be one to one? If you assume the outputs are equal, what do you have to show? Show that x equals y. Show that the inputs must have been equal. That's not true for functions that are not one to one. Like, you know, x squared is not one to one. Just because the square of two numbers x squared equals y squared doesn't mean x equals y, right? Because, for example, 3 squared equals 9, but so does negative 3 squared. Well, what does this mean? It means by the formula for, for this function, t sub g, it means little g times x equals little g times y. That's just the definition of what this function t sub g is. It's formula. And then cancellation tells you x equals y. So this is the definition of t sub g. And this is left cancellation in the group capital G. So it is one to one. Is it on to? Given, call it say G prime in capital G. Does there exist X in capital G such that T sub G of X equals G prime? If that's true, the fact that G prime is arbitrary means that T sub G will be on to. Right? That's what I'm doing. Give me an out, give me a possible output, show it's a real output. Give me something in the codomain, show it's an element of the image. Right? Using those words. We haven't really used those words much recently. Got an idea here? What should X be? It's got to be related to G and G prime, right? Because that's what you're given. That's the only natural thing to pick, something related to G and G prime. This, that's not quite the natural thing I want to emphasize ultimately, ultimately though. A little scratch work over here. We'd want to solve G times X equals G prime for X. That's what we want to do. But that's easy, easy. Just multiply both sides by G inverse. That's equivalent to X being G inverse times G prime. And that's got to be the answer. Yes. A more formal direct proof would say T sub G of G inverse times G prime, lots of G's there, is by the formula for T sub G, G times 
g inverse times g prime and being extra picky about using the associative property and emphasizing that that equals e the identity of g there we have it there's the fork that proves t sub g is onto so this is a permutation it's a it's a one-to-one -one and onto function from this set to itself remember that permutations the, the set doesn't have to be a group when you're talking about permutations g is a group but the only thing necessary to have a permutation is that it's a set but of course groups are sets all right but is it a group of permutations do the tgs form a group of permutations that's not hasn't been proved yet under function composition if i let g bar be the set of all the tgs as little g ranges over capital g does that form a group under function composition that has not been proved yet The next sentence claims it is true. G bar is a group under function composition and evidently verifies it. Let me skip that verification for the sake of time and jump ahead to the last paragraph here, or the yeah, last main paragraph. What's the isomorphism between G and G bar? Let's not look at the book. Well, we should write down G bar here. So G bar is the set of all these t sub g's as little g ranges over capital g and the operation is function composition maybe i should say is a group under the operation of function composition in other words it is a permutation group I'm assuming it's a group to talk about now the isomorphism. What is the isomorphism The book calls it phi. It's not the order phi function. it's going to be an isomorphism. From G to G bar. And the thing to emphasize here again is what is the only natural thing to do? What is the only natural thing to do? Emphasis on the word natural, partially because it is natural, and partially because if you get further into the subject, the word natural actually becomes a technical term that I won't technically define, but you'd have to go beyond our book to, to get into what that means, something called category theory, which we won't get into. But here we can just think of it as like, what's, what's, think of it as what's the only thing that makes sense to do to define this isomorphism and hope it's an isomorphism. I mean, you've got to still prove it's an isomorphism, We've got a map. What's the only thing to map an arbitrary element in capital G to that is in G bar? The only thing that makes sense to try, if you think about it, is to map little g to capital T sub little g. Right? That's the only thing that even makes sense to try. Like, what else would you do? I mean, I guess, I guess you could map it to T sub G inverse as something else you could do. And, and maybe that would work still. But this is a little bit more natural. You want to map an arbitrary element from G into to an element of G bar. You don't know what group G is. Its elements could be numbers, its elements could be functions, they could be matrices. Little g could be a matrix. It's just an abstract thing here. 
element of G bar has got to be a permutation. It's a group of permutations, these TGs. And so, yeah, go ahead and map little g to t sub g. But then you have to show this is a one to one and onto function and also operation preserving. You got to show it's an isomorphism. Well, it's pretty obviously onto, right? Give me an arbitrary element of g bar, call it t sub g. That little g will be what gets mapped to t sub g. The onto fact is obvious. It's almost, it's one of those things that's almost so obvious it might be confusing. One to one maybe is a little trickier. If you assume phi of little g equals phi of little g prime, say, by definition of the formula for phi, that means t sub g equals t sub g prime as functions. These are functions. What does it mean for two functions to be equal? It means the outputs of these functions are the same for any given input, for all given input. I guess I already said that for any given input. To show this, We need to prove t sub g of x equal t sub g prime of x for all little x in capital G. When we're assuming, well, that's what we need to prove. When we're assuming this is the formula. We are assuming this is true. Um, excuse, excuse me, that's not what we want to show. Sorry, I, I no wonder I was feeling confused. We know this is true. We're not trying to show this is true. We know this, so this is true. Why do we know this? Because we're assuming this is true. I got I got confused. Start from the beginning. What, what what's my goal and what I'm writing here? My goal is to show phi is one to one. So starting from this assumption, my real goal is to show g equals g prime. Right. I'm assuming the outputs are equal, I must show the inputs are equal. But this fact means this fact is true. So I don't need to prove this. It's the definition of what the formula for phi is. We know this is true, so what does that mean? It means this is true. And that means gx equals g prime x for all x and g. But that means by right cancellation that G equals G prime. Actually, you don't even need the, the for all to get to that conclusion. If that's true for even one X, then G would equal G prime. It is true for all X, but that's more than is necessary to conclude that G equals G prime. Right, right cancellation, canceling the X's. Is this operation preserving? That would be the final thing to prove. For sake of time, let's look at the book's proof. <clears throat> to this end, let, well, I'm gonna show it's operation preserving. To this end, let A and B belong to G. You must show this equals that. What's this equality from right there? That's from the definition of phi, right? Phi of G equals T sub G. Therefore, phi of A times B is T sub A times B. What's this equality here? It's the same thing. Phi of A by definition is T sub A and phi of B by definition is T sub B. So the only thing of significance to prove is that equality there. 
Now the book just writes it. Why? Well, essentially because they already proved it. They proved it back up here when they were proving that um, G bar was a group in the first place. That equation right there, which is proved using the formula for T sub G and T sub H here and using what function composition means and using the associative property prove that equation. And that equation is used down here. Okay, so this is a very abstract thing. As you're studying abstract things like this, you should study examples like example seven. And then I would encourage you to make up your own example like similar to example seven. Bailey's theorem is named. It is an important theorem. I haven't emphasized it yet, but it technically is an important theorem. Why is it important? Well, it essentially says that we can study all groups by studying permutation groups if we wanted to. Now, that's not always the best way to go, but in theory, it could be done. Since every group is isomorphic to a group of permutations, the study of groups in general is equivalent to the study, study of permutations, groups of permutations. Okay, so maybe if it, if it seems easier to think about a given group as a group of permutations, for example, then maybe that's the way you should think about it. Moving on to chapter seven. Of course, we have Lagrange's theorem. I have put the proof of Lagrange's theorem on old exams from what I've taught this course in the past. It's not actually that hard a proof once you know the properties of cosets. Um, and instead of just thinking about this as a bunch of separate arguments, I think it is also helpful to uh, draw a picture, draw, say, a Venn diagram, a blob. Imagine the blob is G. And remember conceptually the property of cosets is they, they partition G into disjoint sets, non overlapping sets whose union is all of G. That's a fundamental fact about cosets. In particular, left cosets, it's also true for right cosets, but traditionally we think about this in terms of left cosets. And what's not always true about partitions is that the order of the sets in the partitions, in other words, the cardinality or number of elements, is not always constant. However, in this context, when G is finite and you're talking about left cosets, partitioning Gs, all those cosets have the same order, same number of elements. And so when you, that allows you to say this equation is true, which ultimately gets you to your final conclusion really quickly, that the order of H must divide the order of G because the order of these are all equal to the order of H. Certainly should, on the test, you should be able to prove corollaries of Lagrange's theorem. These are pretty quick proofs. Um, well, Fermat's little theorem is a bit trickier. I haven't talked about Fermat's little theorem and I'm not going to talk about it right now other than to say it's got important applications. I'd probably have to, I mean, you should study it and understand it. Maybe I'd give you a little hint or something if, if I put it on the exam. Fermat's little theorem is important in cryptography. So this theorem, this modest looking theorem uh, is one big key of why your internet transactions are secure, hopefully, at least until quantum computers get powerful enough. And the, well, when that happens, hopefully they got new algorithms that will still keep things secure. What I prefer focusing on now, don't forget about studying these two theorems and remembering these as well. These are pretty important on pages 144 and 145. But I'd prefer focusing on the orbit stabilizer theorem, actually, because once again, this is going to reemphasize this concept of naturalness. So let's look at this theorem again. I should probably remind you what orbits and stabilizers are. <clears throat> once again, we're thinking about the context of permutation groups, just like with Cayley's theorem. <clears throat> 
So a stabilizer of a point, let G be a group of permutations on a set S. S is not necessarily a group, just some arbitrary set. As an example, S could be the set of numbers one, two, three, four, five, and G could be S five, the symmetric group on five objects. S could be a group of five people, and G could be the symmetric group on those five people. S can be any set. For each I and S, for each element of the set S that is not necessarily a group, the stabilizer of that element in G is, notice it's a subset of G. It's a set of functions in G. G is a collection of functions being a group of permutations that map I to itself, stabilize I. Again, when you think about a abstract definitions or theorems, you should think about examples. So we should think about like this example here. We're thinking about the group S8. So the set S is the numbers one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. But these are permutations, these are functions in cycle notation. What's the stabilizer, for example, of two? It's this subset of G. Those are the per two permutations in here that map two to them, two to itself. Every other permutation in this one, two, three, four, five, six element group maps two to something other than itself. This one here looks like it maps two to one. This one also maps two to one. This one maps two to three. This one maps two to three. Only the identity and this one, which doesn't have a two in, two in it notation, map two to itself. That's why that's the stabilizer of two. The stabilizer is a subgroup of G. I think that was maybe even a practice problem from chapter three on subgroup test. So that's a subgroup of G. You can use it one of the either the one or two step subgroup test for that. All these are subgroups of this group. These three are all the same, and they're all isomorphic to each other and to Z2, cyclic of order two. This one's got three elements, it's got to be isomorphic to Z3. It's got to be cyclic. Remember, groups of order prime are cyclic. That's a consequence of Lagrange's theorem. Groups of prime order are cyclic. That's a fundamental fact to know. What's the orbit of a point? Let G be a group of permutations on a set S. <clears throat> Once again, for each I and S, you can define something. Whereas the stabilizer is a subset of G and, in fact, a subgroup of G. The orbit is a subset of I, or excuse me, of, of S. Look at all the outputs phi of I. As phi varies over G, phi of I is an element of S, right? Because you're plugging I into phi. And phi is a function from S to itself. So phi of I has got to be in S. This is a subset of S, and S is not a group necessarily. I mean, it could be a group, but it's not necessarily a group. So this is not necessarily a subgroup. It's not necessarily a group itself. It's just a set, it's some subset of S. Though we still use order notation to denote the number of elements in it. Probably would be better to call that a cardinality. Because the, card, the word cardinality is a more general word for number of elements in something. Order really were, more refers to just group theory. So these are all subsets of S over here. S being the set one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. That finite set. The orbit of four under G. What are the possible things get that four gets mapped to? This one maps four to itself. So yes, four is an element of its own orbit as is any element because phi could be the identity permutation as this one is. 
Here, four gets mapped to six, so six is in the orbit of four. Four gets mapped to six here as well. It gets mapped to five here, so five's in the orbit. It gets mapped to five, gets mapped to itself. So the orbit is four, six, five, or four, five, six. The order in here doesn't matter. The order in the list, right? The order that you put things in a set doesn't matter. I could have written four, four five, six as well there. <clears throat> and the orbit stabilizer theorem then says that if G is a finite group of permutations on a set S, by the way, S itself doesn't have to be a finite set. For example, really remember that we can think of dihedral groups, group of symmetries of a square, for example, as being a permutation group actually on the set of points in a square. And the set of points in a square is an infinite set. So S here could be an infinite set, but G is a finite group of permutations. Then for each I in S, the order of the finite group G is the product of the order of the orbit and the order of the stabilizer. Let's look at the proof of this. And again, I'm trying to gonna emphasize the naturalness of a certain part of the proof. It uses Lagrange's theorem. It's an application of Lagrange's theorem. And the fact that the stabilizer of I and G is going to be a, a subgroup of G. Sorry. <clears throat> By Lagrange's theorem, this is a fraction there. This is not a well, if you've read ahead in chapter nine enough, it's not a uh, it's not a factor group there. This is the ratio of two numbers, the order of G divided by the order of the stabilizer. But Lagrange's theorem says that's an integer because the, the order of the stabilizer has got to divide the order of G, but it also says it equals the number of distinct left cosets. Remember that Lagrange's theorem does say a little bit more than just the order of G, H divides the order of G. It also says the number of distinct left cosets is the order of G divided by the order of H, which is an integer, which is also, remember, called the index of H and G and also written this way. This thing down here is just notation. Right, that's the notation for the index of H and G. It's the notation for the number of L, number of left cosets of H and G. But by Lagrange's theorem, it equals this, which is an actual division of numbers, and it gives you an integer. So that's the application of Lagrange's theorem. What do you want to show? You want to show that this fraction equals the order of the orbit. Then this equation will be true, right? Because if you divide both sides of this equation by the order of the stabilizer, you get this expression on the left. So you want to show that this expression equals that number right there. How? Well, it's good enough not to come up with an isomorphism between those sets, because remember, this set's not, not a group. But instead, just a one-to-one -one and onto function. It suffices to establish a one-to-one -one correspondence. That means one-to-one -one and onto. When it says one-to-one -one correspondence, it means more than one-to-one. -one, it means onto as well. Between the left cosets of the stabilizer and the elements of the orbit. What's the only natural thing to try? Do they give the correspondence a name? They actually, looks like they don't. Oh, they call it T. So they're trying to come up with a correspondence T from uh, the collection of left cosets of H in G, uh, sorry, let me do this. T is got a domain that is the left cosets 
of the stabilizer, which is a subgroup of the given I in G, that collection whose order or cardinality equals that fraction in the in the proof because of Lagrange's theorem. Right? Because again, Lagrange's theorem partially says that the number of left cosets of H and G is this fraction. H here is the stabilizer. To the orbit. We got to come up with a one to one and onto function like this. And it is just one to one and onto. You don't have to prove its operation preserving because. Well, neither of these, this thing for sure is not a group. Right over here. Actually, we'll see in chapter nine that this thing actually is a group on the left called the factor group. Which, yeah, you should have watched the lecture that I talked about factor groups a little bit. When I talk about normal subgroups, normal subgroups lead to factor groups. This actually is a group, but this is not necessarily a group. So I'm only after a one-to-one -one and onto function here, not, a, not an operation preserving function. What's the only natural thing to pick? Give me an arbitrary left coset. Say little g stabilizer like that this thing is playing the role of the capital h this is a left coset notation here this whole thing is a left and arbitrary left coset of the stabilizer in g What's well, the only natural thing to map this to in the orbit? Oh, and I should I should probably use a different letter here than a G. This is a group of permutations. Maybe I should use a phi instead of a G here. And that's what the book does. Phi is a permutation from S to itself. I is an element of S. What's an element, a natural element of the orbit of I? The only natural thing to pick here is phi of I. Well, maybe phi inverse of I would also be natural, but this is a little bit more natural. It's like the only thing you that makes sense to pick, to try. There's an arbitrary left coset of the stabilizer of I and G. There's an arbitrary element of G. C here is an arbitrary element of G because G is a group of permutations. So I want to use the phi notation here to emphasize that this is a permutation. It's a permutation of S. I, I haven't written S anywhere, but I is an arbitrary element of S. I want something in the orbit. Well, what is the orbit? The orbit is the set of all kinds of outputs like this. And so that's the way my output of the T function has to look. And that's the only natural thing to pick. This is an element of the orbit of I and G. Of course, you got to prove this is one to one and onto. I don't want to prove that, but let's take a few minutes to look at something else in the book that's also very important. And while it's not exactly the theme of naturalness, it is another important theme to emphasize that comes up not just in chapter seven, but also in chapter nine and 10, I think. The concept of showing something a function is well defined. The formula that I wrote down for capital T actually has some ambiguity to it. Wait, how could this have ambiguity? Isn't this straightforward, even if it's confusing? It has ambiguity because 
what if I wrote this left coset in a different way? What do I mean by that? Remember, just because AH equals BH, that does not imply A equals B. You can have different representatives for the same coset. It does imply, what does it imply? It does imply A inverse B is an element of H and B inverse A is also an element of H. Remember that? Properties of cosets. But it doesn't mean A equals B. So the issue here is, what if you had a different representative other than this phi? Like, what if you had a phi prime, but it was the same left coset? Does phi of i equal phi prime of i? That's the issue. Does that make sense? If you had a different representative, would you get the same output? That's the issue. That's, that's the ambiguity that needs to be resolved. And resolving it is called showing this function is well defined, or showing this correspondence is well defined. That's good how the book does it. Okay, then instead of you, instead of phi and phi prime, they use alpha and beta. So assume alpha stabilizer equals beta stabilizer. Stabilizers like the H, these are cosets, left cosets. Saying alpha H equals beta H where alpha and beta are not necessarily the same. The question is, does alpha of i equal beta of i? And the conclusion is that it does, but that needs to be proved. How do they prove it? Just sort of following their nose, like well, what does it mean? They say this implies phi of i equals beta of i. Is that obvious? Not sure what that's obvious. Oh, okay. They're just saying what that's what we must show. Sorry. That's the conclusion. So they're just this here, they're just saying we must show. Okay, but what does this mean? It means just like I wrote down with the H before and the A and the B, it means alpha inverse beta is in the stabilizer. It also means beta inverse alpha is in the stabilizer. And all of this flow right here. Property of left cosets. Pretend this is an H here. Alpha H equals beta H means alpha inverse beta is in H. Stabilizers like the capital H. But what does that mean? What does it mean for this to be in the stabilizer? It means it maps I to itself. Alpha inverse beta of i must equal i. But that means beta of i equals alpha of i. Why? Alpha inverse beta of i equals i. You could think of this as saying alpha inverse of beta of i equals i. And then you could apply alpha to both sides. Alpha of alpha inverse of beta of i equals alpha inverse of i, and then these are inverse functions. So this is the same as beta of i. Um, excuse me, I meant to, sorry, this is not an alpha inverse. <clears throat> the more, uh, I mean, it's a good to make sure you understand these details, but the more important thing is to understand why you need to do it in the first place. Show it's well defined is because you can have different representatives for the same coset. You got to show that this formula makes sense that T maps this coset to that element of S. Does that formula even make sense? Comes up again in chapters nine and 10. Running low on time here. Um, let me just say, 
that, well, first of all, for the content from chapter eight and external direct products, you got to do a lot of examples. Okay, the way to understand chapter eight is through examples. So we did a few examples back a couple weeks ago. Um, book does plenty of examples. Make sure you work through these examples, think about them, and use the examples maybe more than the proofs themselves to understand things like, well, like this fundamental fact that the order of an ordered n tuple is the LCM of the orders of the components. I mean, the proof's not that hard, but the examples make it seem more real. I do plenty of examples in the lectures. So I'm saying I'm not having as much time here in class with you guys to do examples, but you should make sure you work through examples, not only in the reading, but also with the lectures if you haven't you've gotten behind on that, or if you need to review a lecture, watch it again even, uh, you might want to, to make sure you get this down solid. And this fact that the external direct product is cyclic if and only if the orders of G and H are relative to prime, and G and H themselves are cyclic, finite cyclic, which leads to, this important corollary, well, a few important corollaries, one being ZM is isomorphic to the uh, external direct product of the factors of M when you factor it this way, if and only if each pair of these ends are relatively prime, each distinct pair. So for example, think about example, Z6 is isomorphic to Z2 external direct product with Z3. But Z4 is not isomorphic to Z2 external direct product with Z2. Two and three are relatively prime, but two is not relatively prime to itself. Say that again. Z, Z6, for example, is isomorphic to Z2 external direct product with Z3. Two and three are relatively prime. But Z4 is not isomorphic to the Z2 external direct product with Z2 because two is not relatively prime to itself. Z8 is also not rel uh, isomorphic to Z2 external direct product with Z4, because two and four are not relatively prime. Plenty of examples like that. This corollary is also helpful to think about examples with, with the U groups. And that corollary along with these facts down here that are not labeled as a theorem, but you might want to label it as a theorem yourself. You might want to write the word theorem over here or something. These facts are fundamental to understanding the U-groups. But again, if you're more going to more fully understand this more fully, have it in your heart and soul, you might say. You just remember it because you, you've done so many examples. You want to make sure you spend the time thinking about lots of examples. And in part, the practice problems are meant to help you make sure you do that. So you should do as many of those as you can. Even, you know, by the way, when you write up your answers to practice problems, you don't have to do nice polished proofs or anything, right? You're, you're writing it for your own benefit. So write as much as you want. You can make it scratch work like, or you can try to make a polished proof if you really want to in a given problem, or you can just be doing calculations. You're trying to, you're trying to understand. That's the goal with the practice problems. And I give you the flexibility to do as many as you want. I mean, I know that means some people do hardly any, any but you know, we've gotten a, a test coming up Wednesday or next week. So you, you know, if you've been putting that off, you probably want to put more time into that. Uh, let me just say here in one minute that chapter nine is, yes, still hard, but very, very important. Normal subgroups and factor groups. What is a normal subgroup? It's definition, very important. What is a normal subgroup test? Very important. What are normal subgroups for? What are they for? What's their importance? Their importance is for these factor groups, which starts on the next page. And when you study this theorem that defines what a factor group is and what its operation is, 
the well-defined issue comes up again right away. Our first task is to show the operation is well-defined. And this issue, these issues of naturalness and being well-defined are things I have put on old exams and I could put on your exam. So we really want, really want to make sure you understand those. So again, work through the examples. Make sure you really work on understanding this example, example 12, it's really important. The relationship between these two Cayley tables is fundamental to intuitively understanding factor groups. Okay, all right, have a good day.